are going to bring a 2021 world champion of NHRA Funny Call, Mr. Ron Caps. And uh, Ron was with us last year and this year is coming back and is going to be hosted by Joe Castello. And this is going to be fun. This is going to be great, Joe, right? No, this is not going to be fun. Of course it's going to be fun. <laughs> I think Mr. Caps is coming on and uh, we should be live within. It was exciting to see him when I was there that weekend oh. in Pomona. Hello, Ron. There he is. There he oh, is. Yes. Hello, Ron. Thank you. Very Thank you for joining. Thank you. Great very to much. be here. Boy, it's, it's been a fun couple of days and listening to Jay talk was that's fun because, you know, obviously it's a great series to watch and I feel like we got a lot of, a lot of stuff that, uh, some people may not know about next year listening to Jay about the IndyCar series. Well, thank you very much. It's been a very educational week so far. So now on to you, Joe. <laughs> thank you, Judy. Thank you, Francisque and Ron. Welcome to you and to all of our listeners from around the world. Uh, if you have questions, you'll be able to use the chat section. We've got uh, world champion Ron Caps, fresh in from his 2021 NHRA Camping World Series Funny Car Championship. Uh, Ron, you were victorious, and, and we have spoken many times in full disclosure. I, I work at the NHRA as one of their track announcers. I get to interact with Ron on a regular basis, and so we'll talk about some of that stuff. But Ron, uh, simply put, this championship, your second of your career, people were saying this was the most competitive year of funny car racing ever. Would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. And we, But we do say that it, it seems like in the funny car division every pretty much every year, but pound for pound. I mean, we went into the countdown, our championship playoffs, if you will. And I don't think we saw a more stacked field than we've ever seen from top to bottom with, and what I mean by that is I mean teams that could win from the 12th position, uh, 11th, 10th position at any given time. So yeah, I would say for sure that was one of the toughest seasons I've been involved with. And coming out victoriously, and uh, we're definitely going to talk about that, but I also like to think of this opportunity as a way to introduce many people out there to the sport of drag racing, which I believe that NHRA drag racing is having a moment right now with uh, people coming in, like Tony Stewart drag racing, getting involved and in what Antron is doing, and you'll be having an announcement at the PRI show in a few weeks or next week uh, about what you're going to be doing. Uh, drag racing is a sport that's been around for 70 years, but seems to have recaptured the imagination of people out there. It's it's perfect for right now. And yes, we've been talking Formula One and NASCAR. Brad Gerber from NHRA is going to join us tomorrow. But give me your assessment of the sport of NHRA drag racing right now as someone who got your start in 1995, uh, who has raced for the greats like Don the Snake Prudhomme and Don Schumacher. Uh, where do you think the sport of NHRA drag racing is right now? Well, it's just sort of capsulize it. You know, it wasn't too long ago. I came in to the funny car division, you know, the likes of Kenny Bernstein. I uh, was driving for Don Perdome when I came in. Um, and I always found early on, and this is, uh, gosh, 1998, when I drove the Copenhagen car for Don Perdome, we would go on these media tours. And every race car driver watching this right now knows exactly what I'm talking about. They would send you out sometimes in the outskirts a couple hours away from an upcoming race. And, and you almost felt like for a while that you almost had to almost school the local sports person at some of these little towns uh, on drag racing. And it depended on what part of the country we were in. And, and I'm sure IndyCar can talk about this, even NASCAR. Uh, it, it's just, it's evolved so quickly here the last decade, especially since 2016, we won the championship and rolled right into the Fox network taking over the NHRA programs and FS1 and, and it just has blown up. And I, I would attribute it a lot of these last few years and the growth of NHRA uh, to that, our TV program with the Fox people and FS1. So, you know, I always, it's funny because we'll get a qualifying run on Friday at any given racetrack around the country and I'm doing the burnout and I'm backing up and I look up and the grandstands are packed. And you're like, okay, a lot of people are playing hooky today. Um, and then Saturday completely sold out at different racetracks. And with COVID, the way that we we're getting back in society right now, you couldn't hear a lot about sellouts. And But we had a lot of them this year. So it really made me feel good about our sport. I think everybody involved in NHRA drag racing 
already knew it was doing fine. Um, but it's uh, it seems like it's really right now just like this, and it's it's fun to be a part of it. We just had Ray Evernham on a little bit earlier, and he was talking about SRX, and of course, he's partnered with Tony Stewart, who is now part of NHRA, and it's all, uh, it, it's weird, it's, it's the motorsport world is all uh, coming together. You'll be happy to know, he mentioned the possibility of an NHRA team and SRX, FYI, I'm hoping that maybe uh, you, you'll get a phone call, but what they were talking about as a success for what they plan is to have the fans feel like they are part of the event, to be inside what the event is, as opposed to on the outside watching somebody do something, to be a part of it. And to me, I thought that that's the essence of drag racing, to be at the meet, to be in the pits, to go watch your heroes and, and the guys who tune and build their cars disassemble and reassemble a car in 40 minutes and then go race again and, and feel like you're riding with that team. And just listening to those guys talk a little bit about it, it made me reconnect with why I love drag racing, which is already doing that. Yeah. And, you know, we have a great niche with drag racing. It always has been. It's been a, a great uh, fan friendly sport. And, and I'm not saying that none of the other motorsports aren't, but we've just had this interaction where every ticket's a pit pass. Now, a lot of these other sports and motorsports can't pull it off like that. It just, but I think today's, in today's world, especially with these things, yeah. um, the attention span of people are, it's so much shorter. And I don't think sitting in a grandstand for three and a half, four hours is what it used to be for a lot of these fans, nor is it turning on the TV and watching the same thing for that long. So I think that that sort of, I guess you can't call it ADHD. It's just the way things are now. People are, are uh, they're on to the next thing so quickly. So I think that that's really what attracted anybody new that came to an NHRA drag race. You go watch this incredible session of cars run, and then you go right behind the grandstands into this pit area and you walk around. It's like being backstage at a Rolling Stones concert, right? You walk around, you see the stars, you hang out, you get a picture of John Forrest or myself or you know name anybody so i think we've all known it's been there but i think that's really in today's world it's uh you know it's for somebody coming that's new and never been to one it's eye-opening and you and i have talked about this before there's nothing better than bringing somebody out new to something cool and we have something pretty cool with nhra drag racing and so i i i really feel like the way things are nowadays and our sport kind of mesh together uh, pretty good. I, you know, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but it's almost the TikTok of motorsports, right? Short yeah. attention span, extreme, and uh, maybe highly addictive. Um, your career has been, uh, you know, second to one. You know, they say second to none, but it's, it's like second to one in that you have raced in an era where John Force has also raced. But that having been said, 68 wins, two championships, and really, in many ways, the face of drag racing because of who you raced for. You mentioned Don the Snake Perdome, who had a book earlier this year or maybe last year during the uh, pandemic where you know he revealed that the Copenhagen sponsorship that you raced was kind of put in his lap by AJ Foy. And I, I just would love to hear you speak a little bit about relationships to other forms of racing. A nickname that you had was Mario. Mario Andretti was on just the other day. He talked about some connections to drag racing with uh, Bob Tasca Sr. Uh, early on at Tasca Ford and was referencing Bob Tasca. Drag racing is different because we're just accelerating as rapidly as we can, but at the same time, it's woven through the fabric of worldwide motorsport one way or another because uh, you know everyone's connected to someone, whether it be Snake or Bernstein, Bernstein, Larry McReynolds, whether it be uh, Rusty Wallace, Raymond Beadle, who uh, you know supported his first championship uh, endeavor. So let's talk a little bit on that drag racing's place in world motorsport. Well, yeah, it's what's fun for me is to go around and, and run into Roger Penske or run into Mario Andretti and these people that. Um, that pay attention to what, what our sport's doing. But for me, I was thrown into this sort of rock star uh, world in our sport because I, I went to work with Don the Snake Perdome. And one of our first trips we took, 
was to a NASCAR race and we went right into Dale Earnhardt's bus and sat down in there and I'll, I'll never forget it. Like we were getting ready to walk in and he said, whatever you do, don't talk racing. Yeah, he just doesn't, you know, if he'll talk fishing, hunting, and it ended up being so true. But anytime I run into somebody that I look at like, oh my gosh, there's, like I said, Penske or Mario, or, you know, you go down a list of anybody that um, for me as a fan has looked up at, uh, I was thrust into that driving for the snake. So I quickly had to learn to keep, keep cool when I'm around these heroes and, uh, you know, showing up and going to Mar Andretti's house before I race in Maple Grove, Pennsylvania one year, little things like that, that would make you want to pinch yourself. But it's always been fun to run into these people since then and all these heroes because they follow what we're doing. And they always, uh, Mr. H, uh, Mr. Hendrick, uh, we just talked the other day on the phone and he, every time I run into him at something, it was, he talks about his early days of drag race and Jack Roush. Um, you know, they've all had something to do in, in back in the day. And it's always cool to listen to their stories. And, uh, you know, that, you know, what I, what I love about the history of the sport of drag racing is how uh, you can go back and look at this old footage and you could see a Richard Petty showing up, taking a year off of NASCAR and driving or Mario Andretti with association with Tasca and, things you never really used to know, but they've all got something to do with drag racing. And uh, it's, it's awesome to, to hear some of their, their old stories. Well, the, the acceleration that they feel off pit road and the acceleration that everybody feels when they come off a, a, a you know, a green light at a stoplight, of course, within the legal limits given by the local uh, police. Yeah. But, uh, of course, but uh, like that's the feeling of drag racing. But then at the highest level in an 11,000 horsepower funny car and a team of, uh, you know, 10 guys rebuilding this machine with a corporate sponsor like Napa going out and racing with a championship on the line, as you did in NHRA's playoff system recently, that adds the extra element of competition. So let's talk a little bit about that performing under that maximum pressure you were with a new team of guys this year, um, uh, and you had said that you kind of felt like a rookie again, that you had to prove yourself again, that this, were, this wasn't your group of you know, longstanding crew guys that you had been with. You had to go out and kind of knuckle down, and look what happened at the end of the year. You're holding the championship trophy. Yeah, and you know any, anybody that's driven a race car can attest to this. When you get in something that's not your race car, something you're used to getting into, um, and it's for a weekend, like we used to run the prelude of the dream with Tony Stewart. And I was lucky enough to run every year of that. I was in the first year and I, I started, ended up going and practicing and, and doing these events at other small dirt tracks because I wanted to be better when I showed up to race with the best of the best in the world in a car that none of us were used to. And that was what the early days of the prelude of the dream was, but getting in something that weird and that's something that just it doesn't make sense to you when you first get into it as a race car and you've got to adapt really quick. Um, you know, that for me, uh, more than anything stands out. So when I was put together with this team at the beginning of the year, 11th hour, my, my longtime crew chief, Ron Tobler decided to retire. Luckily enough, we had a team that was intact at Don Schumacher racing. We were put together as driver and team and crew member crew chiefs never worked together and uh first race we were number one qualifier but it was much more than that there were a lot of things different that i had to learn in the car a lot and i think those years of the prelude to the dream and jumping in different race cars and sprint cars and things helped me adapt quickly to it or quick quicker than i probably would have and uh and lo and behold we ended up winning the world championship um but there were a lot of this like any race season in any series is you, uh, you fight those difficult times of weekends that nothing seems to be going right and you get through it. And that's sort of what we did as a team. Uh, I'm in Atlanta. I just got to Atlanta for a, a function we're doing with some Napa owners. And we were here about a month ago and we do a, a deal at headquarters and it's all the Napa sponsored drivers. So Chase Elliott, Alexander Rossi, Brad Sweet, uh, Bill McAnally's NASCAR team and our team, the NHRA team. And I, I just looked over and I thought, you couldn't find a more um, tip top, I mean, top to bottom sponsorship series, you know, NASCAR, IndyCar. Um, it was just made me so proud to look over and see every different series and how well they're rep represented 
Um, and, you know, we always start talking about, hey, let's jump in each other's car. Would you try to get my funny car? No. And, you know, I wouldn't do that for the world. I'd get in your sprint car, just things like that. And it just reminds you how lucky we are to have all these different kinds of racing. And I was lucky enough to be able to jump in these other race cars. So when the SRX series, like you talked about, came up, um, you know, it just was so much fun to watch because it was guys getting in it, the cars that they weren't necessarily used to. And it was supposed, supposed to level the field a little bit. But um, I think I think that's what really drew the fans to that more than anything else. No, I, I love it. What is it about these other drivers, though? They never want to they never want to get in the nitro car, you know? Yeah, we used to early on. I drove uh, one of Tony Stewart's midgets at the, the Chili Bowl a couple of times. And Selzy and I would go mess around and we'd go run dirt races. And Doug Coletta would join us and we'd run these charity events and dirt modifieds and and uh, dirt late models and every time we'd be sitting around afterwards having a beer with these guys and these these are the best of the best in every series right doing this charity race in a dirt late model in the middle of missouri or wherever we would be and it would the conversation always come back and i remember tony stewart sitting around a long time ago and and all of us saying hey man just get in the car you want to go take a hit like half track even in a top field dragster and uh, i guys that you think were the best at any kind of race car driving would always say, no, I think I'll pass on that. And when you put them behind a car at the starting line at one of our NHRA events, they definitely say no. So it gives you an idea of the respect that they have. But uh, I'm sure every one of them would love to take a run. Well, and credit to Smoke, who did it, right? And he did it and has done it. And whenever someone asks him, he's like, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, like to compete to, you know, uh, uh, enter an event to compete. It's like, I'm not there yet. It would be disrespectful to these guys and girls who are doing this as professionals because this is very hard. And uh, I love hearing that, right? I love hearing it. I think drag racing has often gotten a bad rap because the cars don't turn, but the driver is doing so much and perfection is expected. You, you can't get a, a bad cornerback. You either, you go out there and you're perfect, you're better than the other guy or you're not. Yeah, and I, I use this analogy all the time when, when I give these speeches, uh, you know, one huge difference, I, I think more than anything with the, our sport of drag racing is you could take, if you choose a NASCAR, or let's say an Indy car, either one of them, and you take a car, if you could, if you could say that car is a 10th place car, and there's certain drivers you could put in that 10th place car, and that car could finish third, fourth, maybe even win the race with certain drivers in it. I mean, that's just a fact. There are some drivers that you could put in there. We've seen it happen in the past. Our nitro cars, you know, 11,000 horsepower, the funny cars especially, they're so evil handling, so unpredictable, quickest, you know, vehicles on the on the planet Earth. Um, these cars are set up to go out and do whatever the crew chief sets it up to do. I can't squeeze a car that's going to be a 10th place qualifying run and make it go to the fifth quickest qualifying run. John Force can't do that. I don't care how good you are. You can't do that. But you can certainly take a number one qualifying tune-up car and make it a 10th place run by not keeping the car straight, by not doing something here or, or there the same every time. And, and so I think that's the huge difference that a lot of people talk about. And, and you hear these drivers come in sometimes as new drivers, and they, you know, they, they're going to come in and they're going to conquer the world. And they're going to beat John Force and Ron Caps, and they're going to do this and that. And you're like, hey, come on in. The water's fine, right? It's it's always a lot of talk, but what they don't understand, it it's not just the guts that it takes to go out and step on the gas of 11,000 horsepower. It takes a lot of guts, trust me, to hold the gas down. But the smarter drivers are the ones that are the most successful and the ones that pay attention, but most importantly, the ones that know when to let off the gas in drag racing, because you can quickly get hurt or worse. Um, you could hurt somebody else or worse uh, in a fraction of a second. And most motorsports and most other race cars, you, you get in a little bit of trouble and you don't quite catch the throttle and get out of the throttle, you're going to be okay. You may tag a wall a little bit. You might get a little bit sideways. You might lose a good lap. But that's the main difference. And I always talk about that. It's not necessarily the bravest driver that can get in a top fuel funny car or, funny, or a dragster. It is the, the smarter ones that are most successful. 
you spent 17 years at Don Schumacher Racing, and you won both your championships there. Over 350 wins at that organization. You delivered them their 19th championship, but you recently announced that uh, you're exactly 19 championships for Don Schumacher. I just like to hear you you talk about your experience there, and uh, you've made the announcement that you you're leaving the organization, making you. Um, for, for my money, the, the biggest free agent story in drag racing right now. I know you've got an announcement. We're going to tease that momentarily. Just speak on your time at Don Schumacher Racing and what, you know, the, the gap, right? Like dra what drag racing was and what drag racing is and Don Schumacher Racing in many ways being that bridge. Yeah, well, you know, early on with Don Perdome, when he hired me, I drove for him for nine years. Um, and then Don Schumacher for 17. I mean, those are two great owners, two completely different on the spectrum of, of who they are and, and how they approach being an NHRA team owner, um, completely different. And so I have paid attention all that time. And the ultimate goal, of course, would be team owner uh, for any race car driver. Um, and so, you know, I had to wait for the right time and never knowing if that that time would show up or when that step should be taken by myself. Uh, I've been a hired driver for 20 something years and I've never had to bring a sponsor to a team owner to get that ride or that seat. And that's what probably I'm more proud of than anything else is the fact that I was hired because they liked what I did in the race car and outside the race car. And Joe, you know, <clears throat> The last probably 20 years, it's more important what you do outside the race car than inside. And I think a lot of new race car drivers coming up and aspiring race car drivers, that's the, the part that really um, they lose touch of reality. And they think if they're just this Tom Cruise looking guy, they're going to get a ride with a million bucks and they're going to keep that ride. You might get the ride, but hanging on to the ride, I don't care if you even brought the sponsor, it's not going to keep happening for very long. And so here, as we've progressed these, these, especially the last decade, it's been really important to make sure that the things you do outside the racetrack are as good if you're winning on the racetrack. Um, and, and there's a lot of times that you don't necessarily have to win on the racetrack if you're doing everything off the racetrack right and representing those sponsors. So the ultimate goal is to be a team owner. I, you know, the Kenny Bernsteins, the Don Perdomes, the Don Schumachers and John Forces, I mean, that is the ultimate goal. And I finally had a chance at taking that step. So yeah, I let John, Don Schumacher know in September and we've been working together on my next step and um, we'll announce next week who the sponsor is and, and some more details. And it's just been, it's been a grind and believe it or not, it was all going on behind the scenes during the countdown for me. There was a lot of that white noise of having to, to, to do all the stuff I never had to worry about with the business side of things coming up. So it could have easily been a, a disaster with the distractions, but, you know, uh, the people around me just helped keep me focused and we were able to get through it. But right now, boy, it's, it's, I'm seeing a, a side of things that I know a lot of people watching right now that are, are owners and the business side of things I've never had to, uh, to really think about. And it's been eye opening. Well, I, I can't wait to hear the announcement. And I know that, uh, you know, here on industry week at ePart Trade, like this is, we're building, we're building to uh, big announcements. And so I'm hoping that everybody is going to pay attention to the social media feeds and the news and, and all motorsports news, because I think it's going to be, uh, I don't want to say shocking to people, but it, you know, news is going to be happening. And uh, when exactly is that, uh, you know, press conference or whatever you're going to have. So everybody can kind of follow you either on Twitter or uh, whatever your social feeds are. Let's get that information out there so everyone can follow it as it happens, because I think this is going to be a big, big story in the world of motorsport. Yeah, it'll be next Friday, uh, a week from this Friday, a week from tomorrow, uh, second day of PRI, and it'll be at the NHRA stage, and NHRA will be streaming it as well. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, a lot of a lot of things, still a lot of things in the air, but um, just it's been a lot of fun. More than anything, all these years, I've really kind of wondered if I ever took the step of being team owner. I mean, how much I've done so many things for people out there without thinking about it. And all of a sudden I'm getting these calls and these people coming up to me wanting to help me. Uh, and it really kind of opened my eyes. You know, we go through what we, you know, your job at NHRA, myself, just you stay like this and you never think about what goes on around you sometimes. And so it's been really fun to uh, 
to have all these different options we have coming up. So I'm excited. And next year, I mean, to, to have the number one on the car, it certainly doesn't help um, when, it, or it doesn't hurt, I should say, when you're going and looking at these new sponsors want to talk and, and things like that. So everything really lined up right. Tim is out there, says, congratulations, Ron, world champion times two, just awesome. And uh, people sending congratulations. One piece of news, uh, and you know, with the big announcement in full disclosure, with the big announcement next week, obviously we're not gonna hammer Ron for like details here, but one detail that is important is that the championship team, the men who won the championship, they will be back with you next year. Am I correct about that? Yeah, we got um, the, the same exact team. And these are, Joe, when we started last January and went to preseason testing, I didn't know their names. Even though they worked with Don Schumacher Race and other teams, I didn't know these kids. And so um, Dean Antonelli, Guido is his nickname, as everybody knows him, and John Medlin, a seasoned veteran and just a, such a great guy. And they work so well together. And we just had a lot of fun. And sometimes you're out here in the grind of racing and people think uh, these fans think it's it's like that all the time. But there are times that you just you uh, you, you got to remember to have fun because we're blessed to be able to do what we do and and represent the people we represent. So it's it's really neat that we are going to be able to continue doing um, what we finished. And that was win a world championship and, and start the year off together. So exciting. I know Francisc and Judy are going to be jumping on here moments from now, but I, I love this opportunity I love all motorsports, but the gateway motorsport was drag racing for me. It's, uh, it's you know, in many ways, the everyman motorsport. It's about acceleration. The American muscle car culture uh, turned into a sport where, you know, millions are watching at home on Fox Sports 1. But uh, to the people around the world who are not fully indoctrinated as I am, who are now, thanks to NHRA.TV and streaming services and the device you just held up moments ago can keep up with drag racing in a way that maybe they hadn't before. We know it's big in Australia. It's certainly big in the Middle East, uh, UK with Santa Pod. But speak to those folks out there that are sports car fans, Formula One fans, international rally fans, uh, and, and speak on drag racing a little bit as a champion, as the current champion at the pinnacle of the sport. Um, you know, speak to those folks about getting involved in drag racing. Well, anybody that's a gearhead or a petrol head or whatever you want to call it around the world, um, the sport of dry racing, it, if you've never been, and it's hilarious when we bring somebody out that we, you can tell them over and over how cool it is. You can, you can brag about how loud, how crazy the noise is. But the fact you get to watch a car go zero to 330 miles per hour in front of your eyes from a standing stop is mind boggling as a fan, let alone being a driver. But what the best part is, is to, to, to watch these race cars go down the track and the, at these speeds that are incredible and, you know, and then to turn around and go right in the pit area and watch these teams and stand just a few feet away and watch them tear these cars apart, put them back together and have them ready to, to go back to the starting line in less than one hour. For me, that's as good a show as being on the track, honestly. And I grew up in the sport. So for the real gearhead, to watch a team tear a car apart, I mean, from burning hot, tear it all completely down to the bare engine, transmission clutch, and put it back together and strap a driver back into that chrome molly tubing and step on the gas and go zero to 335 miles per hour after watching what they just did. It's, uh, it's something that somebody has to see live. And, and if you're into any kind of racing, uh, and you get the chance to go see a drag race. I don't care if you're in Australia or, like you said, wherever you're at, it's uh, take take this the step because it is something you'll never forget. And uh, that's the funnest part for me is having somebody out, whether it's a rock star or somebody I look up to, an athlete. I love having them out to give them that same kind of feeling you get when you're standing on the sidelines of a Super Bowl or whatever you might be doing. On, so it's on fun. that note. On that note, Ron, and I know Francisca and Judy are here, but I think it's important. You had Haley Steinfeld to the <laughs> finals when you won the championship. And I don't know if you knew at that moment that she was going to explode with the new Hawkeye series, but that young lady is going to be one of the biggest stars on the planet 
thanks to that. And she is hanging out in the starting line with Ron Caps at the NHRA finals. Days later, Hawkeye is released on Disney and the world changes for fans of Marvel. If you don't get Marvel, then you don't get it. But Haley Steinfeld and Ron Caps were like winning the championship together. Yeah, and she hung out in the pit area and celebrated us winning the championship uh, the whole time afterwards. It was she was so down to earth and so cool. And yeah, we knew the series was coming out. And uh, yeah, I, I didn't realize how big a deal she was, honestly. And if you're around her, you really wouldn't have known. She was very cool. And her brother Griffin, same thing. So yeah, that's just that's part of it. And that was another instance of having somebody out, obviously, that is that makes some of the, you know, the coolest movies on screen. But when you put her down at the starting line, she was behind our car there. That was that's something she'll be telling her friends for forever. Yes. Well, I hope she can still come back because she's going to be too big a star. Too big a star. I think they're hooked. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Thank you, Ron. Thank you yeah. very much, Ron. What a delight. The concept for EPAR trade is basically, in my opinion, there's a big hole in the internet. So the internet started many years ago, but there's never been an online business community for racers on the World Wide Web. The need for EPAR trade is actually quite obvious. Basically, people in the business of auto racing need a place online to hang out and get their problems solved. It's extremely simple for a buyer or for a supplier to interact on the platform. The first thing you need to do is sign in, which is free. And the second thing is when you see a product that you're interested in, all you need to do is click on request more information. If it's a company, you click on request more information. And then from there, it is forwarded directly to the buyer or to the supplier. You can go to epartrade.com, you become part of a community of businesses in racing, and it makes uh, sourcing products much easier than just on the internet or using Google. At epartrade, there is no e-commerce. It's literally a connection just like at a trade show. So now, any time of the year, a buyer could reach out to a supplier through an email. More than that, it's a place to go just to keep current every day. So it's a good place to start your work day in your racing business or in your offices of your professional race team. And you know you're current when it comes to new technology, industry news, technical papers, technical videos, all of that and more. We're not looking for a million hits per day. All we want is people who are really the volume buyers of racing products in the racing industry to be part of the little world of EPAR trade. We have racing businesses participating from around the world. So you get suppliers from around the world, you get buyers from around the world. EPAR Trade really eliminates having to travel, closing down your shop. Now you have a place to showcase globally your racing product and technology. There are two types of people, racers and everyone else. Racer Magazine is for those who believe that racing is a way of life. Racer embodies the excellence that defines a sport driven by passion, courage, and ingenuity. Get one year of both Racer's print and digital edition for only $39 with instant access to our entire digital issue archive. Subscribe now at info.racer.com.